morning, Vincent Church. How's everyone doing today? Oh, that's great. I love it. I love it. Um, my name is Pastor John McCann. I have the opportunity to serve as one of your pastors here at Vintage Church. Um, can we give it up for the worship band this morning for leading us in that awesome time of worship? Man, I don't know if you all know this or not, but they get here really early in the morning. Some of them are here like six something in the morning for practicing and preparing um, to lead us. So I just want to thank God and honor them um, in this moment. Um, today is a special day for many reasons. One reason why this is a special day is because today is Veterans Day. So I want to take a moment, Vintage Church, we want to honor if you have served or if you know someone and you, or you have a family member that have served, we're going to ask for you to stand up if you or a family member has served. And we want to just honor you. Come on, Vintage Church. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. Um, we are in the middle of our Leadership Pipeline series. So we've, we kicked this off a couple weeks ago. Pastor Dustin preached about the importance of leaders being, being, being willing and able to lead others. You know, you can't say you're a leadership if you're not leading anyone. So we kicked it off talking about that. Last week he talked about serving on um, the responsibility to serve others. If you are a leader, you should be serving those who you lead. And today we're going to be talking about protect protect. Because if, if you are a leader, um, you are called to protect those who you lead. And some people, you might be here, you might be like, well, that's great, John, but I don't, I don't know if I'm a leader. If, if there's someone that looks up to you, you are a leader. Some of us are leaders within our family. Some of us are leaders uh, with our co-workers, leaders at our jobs. And all of us have been called to lead people to Jesus Christ. So as we think about this, as we think about this calling that God has placed on us to lead as we follow after Jesus and do what he says, to lead others, we have this responsibility, and a lot of people don't like to deal with this. It comes with protection. Protection. If, if you truly love someone and you're serving them, you must be willing to protect them, to protect them. And as we think about this, I'm going to show this graph. This is our leadership pipeline um, here at Vintage Church. And, and as you can see, maybe you're here and you're like, well, I'm not sure if I'm a leader. And, and maybe you're praying through what does leadership look like in Vintage Church. As you, as you go through our pipeline, we start off the volunteers, then we go to team leaders, then we go to ministry coordinators, ministry directors, and the church board. So as we, as we think about this and as we're processing this, we're going to be looking at this idea of protection, protection. So you have your Bibles, you can turn to Titus chapter 1. Um, we're going to be reading verses 10 through 16. If you don't have your Bible, raise your hand. Um, our Connect team is coming down. Uh, they want to make sure they place one of these in your hand. Can we get it for our Connect team as well? Just all of our volunteers. We have some of the best volunteers at Vintage Church, and we're so thankful for them. And um, if you're interested in volunteering and serving with us, our doors are open. We would love for you to uh, get plugged in and get in our leadership pipeline by doing that. But we're going to begin reading at verse 10. We're going to be reading from verse 10 through 16. That's Titus chapter 1, verses 10 through 16. If you got it, say amen. amen. If you need me to wait, say hold up. Hold up. All right. <laughs> it's going to be on the screen for those who are asking me to hold up. So, uh, but make sure you find it. We do want you to be able to find it in your Bible. Um, but I'm going to begin reading uh, verse 10 through 16. It says, for there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced. This is Paul talking to the church of Crete. He says they must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, even said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy glutens. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of the people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any good work. And let us go to God in prayer. God, I thank you so much for today, for this morning, God. Um, as we look at this passage, God, and as we look at this responsibility that we have as leaders to protect those that we are leading, God, 
As we look at the responsibility that, that even pastors have to protect the flock, God, I pray that you will speak to us, God, that you will speak through me, that your word will come alive, God, and that we will not leave here the way that we came, God. Let me decrease as you increase, God, as you stir up the leadership gifts that you have placed inside of each one of us, God, so that we can be the leaders that you have called us to be in this world today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, and thank God. So as, uh, as Pastor Brick shared with you all, this past week I went to Haiti. Is there anybody from Haiti in here? Okay, we had a couple people in the earlier, earlier gathering. Uh, so I went to Haiti, and it was an awesome trip. And uh, I'll show you some of the pictures. This was at the orphanage we went to. Uh, so this is my friend that I met. And, and then we have some more pictures as well. You know, that's me. That's some of the pastors that we were with. I'm representing my chain shirt all the way in Haiti. Um, those are some of the kids we got to feed. Uh, you know, got to feed them in the middle. This is me giving some starbursts out. They love starbursts over there. So I had to explain to them, like, you got to keep chewing it. You can't just swallow it. Um, this dude, he just wanted a, a, a lollipop, a little sucker, and then he was happy. Um, so these are just some of the people that we met. Uh, they were just so excited. We went to the orphanage. We went to schools. We fed some people. We were able to see. And we went for an organization called Convoy of Hope. Uh, and this is just some of the streets. You know, Haiti is one of uh, the poorest nations in the world. So, so we went on this trip, and it was an awesome trip. But I have to be honest with you all, I almost did not go. And, and the reason why I almost did not go was because they, they, they reached out to me and some other pastors, like, we want to go on this mission vision trip. We might go to El Salvador. They wasn't sure where they were going to go at first. And they were like, but we're going to go to Haiti. So I said, sign me up. I want to go to Haiti. And then I started telling some people, they were like, oh, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Haiti. And they're like, oh, you don't want to go there. It's dangerous over there. And I'm like, well, it's dangerous on the West Bank. I go over there. So, <laughs> so I'm like, hey, I'm ready. Sign me up. Uh, I love all the people from the West Bank. I used to date a girl from the West Bank. No, no hard feelings. Um, so, so they were like, it's dangerous. So I started talking to people, and then they were like, oh, you're gonna be, you got to be careful. I started talking to people from Vintage. They're like, there's a lot of voodoo and, and witchcraft and all this stuff over there. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm okay. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. And to make things worse, the organization we were going with, they, they give us this packet of information they want us to read through before we go, and it's like a hundred things it's saying. It's like, make sure you keep your eyes straight, don't go astray, you know, all these different things. And I'm like, man, maybe I shouldn't go. You know, I started getting nervous. And to make things worse, at the very bottom of this packet that they gave us, they made a sign off of disclosure saying that if we die <laughs> or if we're abducted, we cannot blame them. So I'm like, all right, Lord, I'm going. If I'm going to go out, I'm going to go out like a boss. Like, sign me up. I'm going to go out. I'm going to go share this gospel. So I sign up, and I go, and, and we, we're flying out this past Tuesday morning, and we get into the airport, and their airport makes New Orleans Airport look good. So, you know, that takes a lot of work because our airport is struggling. But it's going to come up. It's going to come up. And uh, so we get in, and we, we're walking through. As soon as we get off the airplane, people are, like, trying to grab our bags and trying to pull us in different directions. And then we're just going out and literally kid you not, we walk outside, and there's like hundreds of Haitians at the airport, and they're just looking at us, we're like fresh meat, and they're like looking at us, and they're just coming, say, come here, come with me, come with me. Literally, they're like trying to pull us in different directions to try to get us in their vehicles, and the guy who's leading us, he's like, come on, guys, come this way, come on, come this way. So we're like running and huddling through the people, and then we get to the van, he's like, hop in, hop in, hop in. I'm like, what did I sign myself up for? <laughs> So I'm like, man, this is, this is crazy. So then we're driving around. We go to see a couple spots that day, and then we end up going to the Marriott, which is the hotel that we were going to be staying at, which was the only reason why I was really comfortable going. You know, I'm like, we're going to stay at the Marriott. can't be too bad. Um, so we pull up at the Marriott, and there's this huge 15, 20 feet tall gate, iron gate, that opens up as we pull up. And in front of the Marriott, there are about a dozen or so people standing around with rifles. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm pulling, I'm like, where are we? You know, so they're like, we got to have people with rifles standing out at all times at the gate. So I'm like, man, you know, hey, I, I, I almost told the guy over, hey, I'm going to stay here. And y'all go out there and help everyone else. I'm going to stay behind these gates. But no, I, I end up going out and we serve and everything goes well. And we get to our last night there. So I was the youngest pastor there. So it was about 11 or 12 pastors. I was the youngest pastor there. And the Haitians that were kind of hosting and leading us the whole time, they come up to me this last night, and they say, John, do you want to go out with us? I said, go out? I'm trying to stay behind the gate. And then I was thinking, I was like, you know what? I haven't had much luck finding a wife in uh, the States, so <laughs> sign me up. 
I'll go out with you. I'll go see what, see what your city has to offer. Um, but I was like, but I'm not going to go by myself. I was like, I need to find another one of these other pastors that will go with me. So I go find another pastor who was my friend. I was like, hey, the Haitians want to take us out. He was like, sign me up. So it's like we had this plan. We're going to meet in the lobby at 9 p.m. They're going to take us out. So 9 p.m. comes, and me and the other pastor, we, we go down in the lobby. We meet them, and we get in the car, and we're driving out this iron gate. So I'm looking at this gate closed behind me. I'm like, Lord, please bring me back to this gate before the end of the night. And uh, so they're, they're driving, and the guy who's driving starts kind of yelling in Creole, which I don't understand Creole, so he starts kind of yelling in Creole to the other Haitian guy in the car, and we don't know what they're saying. The only thing that we know is every other word we're hearing is like convoy of hope. So we're like, okay, well, maybe they're mad with the organization because they're, like, yelling in Creole. Every other word we hear is, like, convoy of hope. We're like, well, you know, this isn't good. Um, so we're driving. There's not any street lights or anything like that. And then he starts getting really amped up, and he's, and he's talking in Creole. And I kid you not, he pulls a gun from underneath his seat and cocks it and slams it right there in the middle of the council. And I'm, like, thinking, oh, my goodness, it is over. <laughs> I'm thinking they're going to sell us. <laughs> They set us up. <laughs> They're going to sell us. So he's driving, and then in the middle of driving, he literally yells out this prayer. He's like, God, go before us. Protect us. And then he goes back and starts talking in Creole again. So I really didn't know what was going to happen. Um, but uh, I later found out, I'm still here, so I survived it. Uh, I later found out that uh, he was getting the gun out because he was going to, you know, he keeps the gun with him because it's dangerous at night. So we end up going to this place. It's really nice. It's like a rooftop restaurant, and it's like in the middle of like a very poor area. And then we end up going to another restaurant, and we end up going to all these cool places. But the reason why I, I share this story is because as we went in and out these different places, people were coming up to us, and they were trying to tell us, hey, come this way. Hey, buy this. Hey, come down this alley. Hey, do this. And when the people came and tried to tell us different things to, to deceive us and try to tell us different things to bring us down the wrong path, he would tell them something in Creole, and they would kind of back off. And the reason why I share that story is because as he was leading us, he had to call and he had to tell the people they were trying to distract us, hey, quit trying to distract them. And in this letter, we see Paul, he's writing to the church, and he's saying that there's a path for you of truth. There's a path of righteousness. There's a path that God has laid. There's truth found in the word of God. And there's all these hypocrites out there. There are all these people preaching false doctrine. And he says, you have to say something about it. He says, you have to say something about it. When, you, when you're leading others, you have a responsibility to protect others. And that's our focus point this morning. God calls leaders to protect others. If you are a leader, God has called you to protect someone. He has called you to protect those that you are leading. And as we look at this, this passage, it's, it's written to pastors and it's written to elders. But all, all these, these principles that we're going to see are applicable to all leaders. And I want us to focus in on leadership comes with the responsibility to protect others by doing three things. The first thing that leadership comes with the responsibility to protect others by doing is by recognizing the need for protection. In verses 10 through 12, he says, for there are many out there who are empty talkers and deceivers. He lets them know that there are a lot of false teachers out there. He lets them know that there are a lot of people talking, a lot of people trying to distract you, a lot of people trying to, trying to move you on the wrong path and lead you in the wrong direction. He says there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. Who is he talking about? In this context, he's talking about there was a lot of Jewish converts that were trying to say, oh, you need to get you know, your circumcision, you need to get this, you need to get that, because they were so stuck on the tradition that they missed Jesus when Jesus came. And, and he's saying there's a lot of people like that. And, and I think back to just like I have, I've had friends in the city that, you know, uh, they, leave, they leave their cars unlocked. And there are people that have been going around different neighborhoods and they're just trying, you know, they're, they're pulled on all these doorknobs, all these doorknobs. And if they find a door that's unlocked, they're going to go in there and they're going to take everything that's inside that vehicle. And the reason why I say that is because we have to be on high alert, church. There's an enemy out there that's trying to come, steal, kill, and destroy everything that God is trying to do in and through your life. 
There's an enemy. There's liars out there that's trying to come and destroy the truth and the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are enemies out there. The enemy is trying to come and destroy your family, destroy your, your workplace environment, destroy your neighborhood. And you have to be aware that there's a need for protection. There's a need for protection. If, if, if you are leading someone, there is a need for you to protect them. And even as we, we think about, about the church and just how there's all these false teachers out there, all these people preaching all these lies that don't line up in the word of the God, we need to know that there is a need for protection. How many of you all have had, uh, you've seen on TV, it's like, you know, order this bottle of, of holy water and sprinkle it on your wallet and a check will come in the mail. I tried it, it don't work. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't try it. I didn't try it. <laughs> but if it worked, I'll pour the whole gallon of water on my notebook because I need my checkbook. I need some money. But anyway, so you have all these things. And I used to sign up for uh, different contests and things like that. And I put my number and email address in there. And I guess I gave my number to the wrong person that sold it because a couple weeks ago, I get this text message that says, this is prophet so-and-so. The Lord has told me to tell you that there is a prosperity angel that's going to come visit you. To find out more about this angel that's going to come visit you, click this link. (laughs) So I was like, hey, if there's a prosperity angel, I want to know when they're coming. Uh, So I clicked the link. (laughs) And it brings me to this page, and they're like, the prosperity angel is coming on this day. And if you want to know how to talk, to this prosperity angel, I want you to pay me $25, and then God's going to tell me to tell you what are the 25 things you need to do to talk to this angel. So I said, no, I, I said, I'm not paying nothing. I said, there's no prosperity angel in my Bible, so I don't know what you're talking about. And the truth of the matter is, as you think about this, this text, and how can you spot out people in this false doctrine, this false teaching that exists in the world today, it says that a lot of these people, they do it for their own shameful gain. That's what it says in verse 11. So that's one way you could kind of see that, that, that people are not teaching the truth, is they're doing it for shameful gain. Then it says they must be silenced. Paul says they must be silenced. Then he goes on, he's like, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy, lazy gluons. He said that's what their own prophets said about them. He's like, well, that's what the saying is about them, but it's true. That's what Paul is saying in this text. This, this, this word lie in its Greek translation literally ties back to the Cretans because they were known for lying. This is an island off of Greece. They were known for island and lying, and it, it, they were known so much about lying, they were telling people that the tomb of Zeus was on that island. They used to tell people the too much. So, so they were known for lying. And, and as we think about this, we have to be careful in our leadership to recognize that there's going to be a need for protection for others that we're leading. To recognize that the, the, the enemy is coming to try to kill, steal, and destroy. The enemy is trying to come and steal, kill, and destroy. And Paul wants them to know, hey, there are many out there. And there are many people out there as well that are trying to come and still kill, destroy the people that you are called to lead. You have to be aware of this. And, 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 and as I think back to even when I was in Haiti, the, the first group of uh, kids that I served the food to, uh, they were the little, the, y- the young guys, and we go in and they're telling a story. And uh, I was trying to practice uh, my Haitian, my Creole with the, with the kids, put it on Facebook. They weren't too impressed with my Creole. Um, and I only knew how to say one thing, like, how are you? So I would say, Kijon ye. And they will be like, they'll look at me and they're surprised that I knew some Creole. And then they'll say something back and I'll just smile because I, I didn't know what they were saying. Uh, but but, but I'll, go, I'll go in the room and the, the teacher was kind of telling them a story. And it made me think back to the stories that, that we grew up hearing as kids, different fairy tales that we hear as kids. And it reminded me of the story of the Little Red Riding Hood. You remember that story? Uh, the Little Red Riding Hood, you know, her grandmother is sick. So the mom sends the Little Red Riding Hood down through the forest to go bring some goodies to the grandma. On the way, the big bag wolf sees the Little Red Riding Hood and kind of distracts her, has her pick some flowers, goes to the house. Depending on which version you read, he either ate the grandmother uh, or locked her in the closet. And then he dresses up like the grandmother. And then the Little Red Riding Hood gets there and she's like, oh, Granny! 
what big ears do you have? And Granny's like, oh, it's the better to hear you, sweetheart. And they're like, oh, Granny, what big eyes do you have? Well, it's the better to see you, sweetheart. And then it goes on and on, and eventually she's like, oh, Granny, what big teeth do you have? And the wolf is like, the better to eat you with, and goes and tries to eat the little Red Riding Hood. It's a sad story. Oh, uh, I don't know why. <laughs> But I tell that story because we have to be on the lookout because just like that wolf dressed up like the grandmother, there are so many wolves in sheep's clothing and false teachers, and we have to recognize that. We have to be aware about that. There are so many people, so many things uh, that are trying to influence the people that we have been called to lead, and we have to recognize that sometimes the things that are going on with the people we've been called to lead are going to look like good things on the surface, but beneath the surface, they're dangerous. They're dangerous. So as we think about recognizing the need for protection, the, the, the next thing that we must do that we can see in this text is we must, uh, we must leadership comes with the responsibility not to protect others, not only by recognizing the need for protection, but also by rebuking for the sake of protection. Rebuking for the sake of protection. What does it say in verse 13? It says, this testimony is true, therefore rebuke them sharply. Rebuke. People don't like this word. People don't like to do this because when you rebuke someone, you have to confront them. And you can't correct what you won't confront. And some of us, God has called us to lead, and we're leading, and we see things that are out of order, but we don't want to rebuke the problem in the person. Here at Vintage Church, as your pastors, we are committed to anything that rises up, any teachings, any false doctrine that comes up in the midst of this local church, we're going to rebuke it. If it can't be found in the word of God, we don't believe it. And, and you have to be careful because they have so many people out there that say the name of Jesus but don't have the heart of Jesus. And they would say, Jesus this, Jesus that. But they don't have the heart of Jesus. And we have to be willing to rebuke them. What does rebuking mean? It means to correct and reprove. And as we think about rebuking, and, and even in this text, when you rebuke, what does it say? It says, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in faith. What is the point of rebuking someone in this text? It's to correct them. The, the Paul is saying there's a hope that these false teachers will repent. He says, re, re, rebuke them so that they may be sound in the faith. We have to rebuke some people sometimes. We have to have that hard conversation. If we're leading someone and they're going astray and they're not lining up with the word of God, or we're leading someone and they have people and things going around them, they are putting them in danger, we have to be willing to rebuke them in the name of Jesus. Because that's where our authority comes from. Be willing to rebuke them. And as you rebuke others, you know, I get on Facebook all the time, and you have people that do all these Facebook posts, you know, going off about everybody and just stuff like that. And, 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 and yes, we should shine light on that which is lie, but, but our intention and our heart for rebuking the false teacher, should have, we should have a heart to want to see them get better, to help them, not hurt them. And you got so many people bashing false teachers and people who are preaching heresy. You got people bashing them with the heart intention to hurt them instead of help them. You're just as guilty as them. Because the point of the rebuke is to help heal, not to hurt. Some of us have friends. We have people that God has called us to lead, and sometimes God's going to call us to rebuke them. But the, the intention behind that rebuke is to help them, not to hurt them. And, and as I think about just getting rebuked, I, got, I get rebuked a lot uh, when I'm working at places that I don't like. Um, and I used to work in the French Quarter. I worked at, I did valet parking. Um, then I worked at Saks Fifth Avenue. And then I had a job at a, a place called La Trobes. And La Trobes was this place that people would rent out and pay over $100,000 for a reception. Say amen if you did that. No, I'm just kidding. Don't, I don't want to expose you. Uh, <laughs> We have people that pay all this money, and I was such a good server that one day the, the, the guy who was over our crew said, John, you're doing such a great job serving. We want to upgrade you, and we're going to put you in the kitchen as one of our runners. 
So I'm like, he must not know me. I, like, I, <laughs> I don't do well in the kitchen. Uh, I burn borrowed eggs. So he was like, John, we want to put you in the kitchen. So I go in the kitchen. They had me running the food. And then one day they had some type of liquid soup or something that needed to be heated up. And he was like, John, I need you to heat that up. Just put it in like a little container, put it in the microwave. So I take all the liquid soup and I put it in this large aluminum pan. <laughs> and I put it in the microwave. And I'm like, three minutes, start. <laughs> Out of nowhere. Here comes the manager running through, John, what are you doing? Kind of pushes me out the way and stops the microwave. He's like, John, you can't put aluminum in the microwave? And I'm like, you can't? <laughs> he was like, no, you're going to blow this place up. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know. You know? And he had to rebuke me. You know why? Because I wasn't only putting myself in danger. I was putting everyone else around me in danger. And it's important for us to rebuke, and, and Paul is saying in this text to rebuke, because they weren't only putting themselves in danger, they were putting the whole church in danger. And God has called us to lead and protect some people, and we have to lead and protect them in a way that, 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 that we recognize that not only are they putting themselves in danger, but they're putting everyone else around them in danger. So we, we, we rebuke for the sake of protection. And then what's the last thing that we can see through this text as we think about leadership comes with the responsibility to protect others by recognizing the need for protection. Whoever God has called you to lead, recognize that there's a need to protect them. Then, then recognize also that we have a responsibility for rebuking for the sake of protection. You have to rebuke for the sake of protection. You have to have that hard conversation for the sake of protection. And then, and then the last thing that we see is remembering the truth through protection. Remembering the truth through protection. Look at verse 15 and 16. It says, To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. So what is, what is Paul saying? What is Paul saying? He's saying that you have to rebuke. He's telling the pastor and the leader, hey, you have to rebuke these, these people because these people have it twisted. They're forgetting about the truth and found in the power of the gospel. He's saying that these people, to, to, when it says all, to, all things are pure for all the people who believe that things are pure, what they're saying is that, that when we come to Christ, Christ is enough. So all this extra stuff, this circumcision and all these other things that they're saying that needs to be done, if you come to Christ and you recognize the purity found in the power of the gospel, then everything else is pure, not because of your doing, but because of Christ is doing. Because he did it. But then he says, but for the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. So for the people that think that you have to do all this extra stuff, that you have to earn your salvation, that, that, that Jesus is not enough, for the people that think this, they're actually rejecting the gospel because the gospel says that Jesus did, and because he did, now we can. Because he did, now we can. Not we have to do all these things to make it, but because he did, now we can. So as, as, as it relates to remembering the truth through protection, we have to understand that when we don't remember and we don't focus on the truth, that, that, that we sometimes can find ourselves in a situation to where the lies are coming and the deception is coming, and we're so focused on trying to protect them, but we forget the power and the protection of them is found in the gospel. When, you, when you're called to protect somebody, remember the truth of the gospel through that protection. Remember that God loves them. Remember that God sent his son to die for them. Remember this truth. Because as you think about the Christian message, the Christian message affects the whole life. But unchecked things that do not line up with the truth of the gospel, unchecked heresy, unchecked false doctrine, all these things can also penetrate and affect the person's whole life as well. So we must remember the truth through protection. I'll, I'll close with this story. You know, it's kind of cold this morning, right? Yes. <laughs> it's not as cold here well, as it is in the north. I was in Chicago a couple weeks ago, and it was freezing. I don't know if there's anybody from Chicago in this room today, this morning, but if you are, I'm praying for you that the Lord would give you a revelation to stay here and not go back up there. Uh, but I was in Chicago a couple weeks ago, and I was preaching uh, at a church that we're connected to through one of our partners here at Vintage. And so they flew me out there, and they said, John, when you get to the airport, uh, I need you to go to the shuttle station, and there's going to be a shuttle that's going to bring you to your hotel. So I'm like, okay, 
cool. And they're like, we're going to pick you up from your hotel, bring you to the services. So I go to the shuttle station. I get to the shuttle station, and there's like five uh, areas where the shuttles are picking up, like five big doors spread really far apart from each other. So I'm like, what am I going to do? I don't know which door to stand at. So I see a lady standing behind the counter. She has on her uniform, and, and she looks like she knows what she, sh- she should know what she's talking about. So I go to her. I'm like, ma'am, I, I need to get on a shuttle to go to the Wyndham Hotel. She said, oh, okay, perfect. You're at the right door. This is it's, it's door number three. Go stand at door number three, and the shuttle is going to come, and it's going to pick you up, and it's going to bring you to the Wyndham. So I go, and I stand at, at door number three, and I'm waiting. The shuttle's supposed to come at 1245. It's like 1240, I don't see the shuttle. So then it's like 1245, I still don't see the shuttle. So I'm like, this is not good. I'm in Chicago. It is cold out there. I can't walk to no hotel. So I'm like thinking there's a man, he's walking around, and he's looking at at the people next to me. He's like, which hotel are you waiting for? And they're like, I'm waiting for so-and-so hotel. He was like, y'all are in the right right door. And he looks at me. I look kind of confused and lost. He said, sir, which hotel are you waiting on? I said, I'm waiting on the shuttle to go to the Wyndham. He said, sir, this is the wrong door. He said, the door that you need is way down there. And I said, but the lady... The lady behind the front desk over there with the uniform on, she, she said that this was the door. And, and he said, well, I, I'm not sure what you were told, but, but what I know to be true is that if you want to catch your shuttle, you better run down there because that shuttle is not going to pick you up right here. And why do I share that story? Because you and I were leading people who have been given the wrong information from people in authority that look like they should know what they're talking about. They look like they can be trusted. But in actuality, we have people standing at the wrong doors, believing the wrong things. And just like that man, we have a responsibility to say, hey, I don't know what you've been told. But what I know to be true is that there's a God that loves you. Hey, I don't know what you've been told, but what I know to be true is there's a God who sent his son to die for you and I. What I know to be true, there's a God that can give you peace in the midst of every storm. What I know to be true is when you think like you got to give it up, when you think that it's over, I know a God that's Holy Spirit will empower you to keep on going. What I know to be true is that he went to the cross and he died for you and I, but he didn't stay in the grave. He conquered sin, death, and hell so that you and I can have everlasting life. And that's what I know to be true. Does anybody know that to be true? And we have to be willing to say, God, this is what I know to be true. So I'm not going to let people who I'm leading stand at the wrong doors, listen to the wrong voices, be deceived, because I know something that this word tells me. And anything out there that is not lined up with the word and the authority found in the gospel must be denounced. It must must be silenced. And, And the thing about it is, guess what? Just like I was standing at the wrong door waiting for the shuttle, if I didn't find out that I was at the wrong door, I would have missed that shuttle and I would have missed my ride to my destination. And for you and I, we have people that God has called us to protect. And if we don't recognize that, and if we're not willing to rebuke, and we're not willing to remember the truth, we have people that are going to be standing at the wrong door and missing the truth of the gospel to bring them to their destination, to bring them to their purpose, to bring them to the thing that God has called them to do for his glory and for his kingdom. All because we won't speak up. All because we don't want to have the tough conversation of rebuking when rebuking is needed. All because we want to stay in la-la land and pretend like the people that we're called to lead is just going to be all right. That the devil is just going to stand on the side. He's just going to let your family be perfect. He's just going to let you have the perfect finances. He's just going to let you have the perfect health. He's just going to let you have the perfect peace of mind without attacking. That is not true. He's just going to let the church uh, arise and and, and preach the truth. He's not going to send some false teachers in there. No, the devil's going to come in your life. He's going to come in your family, and he's going to try to mess it up. He's going to try to mess up what we're trying to do as a church. He's going to try to mess up the truth of the gospel. And we have to be willing to protect those that he's called us to lead. 
I believe that everybody in this room, that God has called you to lead somebody. Like, well, I'm not a leader. Well, maybe there's a leader inside of you that's waiting for you to respond to this call so that you can lead people to Christ. So that you can lead your family. So that you can lead your coworkers. You can't stay silent. It's too much. It's too much at stake. We can't stay silent. We have to protect. We have to protect. As a leader, you have to protect. As pastors, we have to protect. Paul is saying there's a need for protection. So as I close, who has God placed in your life for you to lead? Who is it? And potentially it's somebody that you don't even realize that God has placed in your life to lead. We have people all around us that are lost. They are looking for truth. That's somebody who you can lead. And as you lead them, as you serve them, be willing to protect them. Be willing to protect them. We don't protect them with our own strength. We don't protect them with our own truth. As we protect them, we remember the truth found in the gospel. So will you protect? Mother, will you protect? Father, will you protect? Husband, will you protect? Wife, will you protect? Coworker, will you protect? Boss, will you protect? Church leader, will you protect? Will you protect? And it's my prayer that you do protect. It's my prayer that you do rise to the occasion and protect who God has called you to protect. Not for your glory, not for their glory, but for his glory. Let us pray. God, thank you so much for this morning. I thank you so much for this word, God. I pray right now, God, for everyone in this room, anyone that's watching online, God. I pray, dear Lord God, that you allow us to recognize that we have a responsibility to protect those who you have entrusted to us to lead, God. I pray, dear Lord God, that we recognize that there's a need for protection. I pray, dear Lord God, that you give us the strength to rebuke. Even as pastors, God, I pray that you give us, as, as we lead this church, the strength to rebuke anything that does not line up with your word, God. I pray, dear Lord God, that as we protect others, that we will remember your truth. We remember the truth found in the power of the gospel. So right now, dear Lord God, thank you for rising up leaders. I thank you, dear Lord God, there are some people that have been sitting in this room that, God, you are calling them to leadership, but they are running from the call. I pray that today is a day of a yes, where they're not going to run from the call to lead. They're not going to run from the call to lead their family. They're not going to run from the call to lead their coworkers, to lead their neighborhood, to lead their friends. But they're going to say yes to the call. And when it comes time to protecting those that you have called them to lead, they're going to protect them, God, with your boldness, with your spirit, God. I ask for forgiveness for anybody in here, God, who you have called to leadership and that have not done, that has not done a good job leading by protecting, God. I pray that this week, you allow us to recognize this responsibility and to protect better than we've ever protected before, God. To protect with your truth. To protect with faith. To protect with knowing, God, that we're not protecting for victory, but we're protecting from victory because we've already won the victory in and through you. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank God.